Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Is reincarnation good or bad? Are there examples of the multiverse in the Bible? Why did God make parasites? Hello and welcome to the 1005th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno coming to you from WON AM and FM Radio in Woonsocket, Rhode Island on the Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live on YouTube. I'm Ben and coming to us via Skype is my dad, Paul. And uh, today we bring you an open line show to tackle some pretty deep questions from our Sharp as Attack listeners. Okay, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, first, we have Doug from Texas. Ah, yes, Doug. Ever pervasive. And Doug writes to us, uh, Aside from concepts of heaven and hell, have you found any uh, multiversal or paranormal uh, world examples in the Bible? Well, I have to say that, uh, yes, everywhere. Um, I have made reference to this multiple times, and sometimes I've incorrectly referred to it as uh, being in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Actually, it's in Hebrews, uh, the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament, and it is absolutely uh, debatable and is debated whether Paul actually wrote that. Uh, the style is different from his other epistles, etc. It could have been someone else who wrote it. But whoever wrote it seems very much to be aware of the multiverse. And we often say that multiversal awareness and ideas uh, were went way back in the human psyche. Uh, ancient religions seem to be very well aware of it. And in this particular case, uh, it refers to a very sophisticated theology of Jesus Christ that he was indeed, uh, that, that uh, God created the, uh, the universes, the worlds, that's what it says in Greek, through him. And uh, I have uh, read it in Greek, and uh, at least the, the most original documents we have, we don't know what the original documents actually said, word for word, uh, but the in the original uh, Greek, it says cosmos, which is the plural of, uh, of what we would say cosmos. It's uh, it refers to it can mean universes, it can mean worlds, uh, you know, all that has been created. So somebody somewhere, you know, and that, that's very often translated in the singular in the uh, lousy English translations uh, of the Bible that we have the, come now to us. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so th there is, is an awareness, really, uh, here and there throughout the Bible, that this is not the only physical world. Certainly, when you look at the miracles of Christ, or any miracles of God in the Bible at all, uh, you really wonder if the multiverse is not involved. For example, uh, the, the ascension of Christ. Um, in the Acts of the Apostles, the uh, apostles watched him rise into the heaven. Where did he go? I mean, there are those uh, among the ancient astronaut theorists We'll always say yes if you watch the series that uh, you have uh, Jesus uh, being taken back uh, to outer space on a UFO. I mean, all right, maybe, but I, I don't put all my eggs in that basket. I would say more accurately, you have a God who has created a uh, really kind of a perfectly balanced multiverse uh, and uh, Jesus is, is moving from world to world uh, as um, many have told me that they understand that to be among the shamans I've uh, 
rubbed elbows with over the decades. There is an awareness that you, you bring from one world to another what you need to make real here. So uh, Jesus, as, as he performs miracles, uh, obeys God's own laws. It's not magic, or may appear to be. You know, it's not that the suspension of the natural laws, it's the restoration of the natural laws to what they should be. That is a very ancient theological understanding, a miracle. A uh, miracle is not, again, the overturning of uh, the natural way. It is the restoration of the natural way, which is supposed to be entirely having to do with life and goodness and love. That's the ancient theology. So uh, I think the Bible is full of multiversal examples, Ben. I, I think it's I think it's an interesting. It is it is interesting to think about because my my first thought when I, I read the question was okay, so you know we refer to parallel worlds. Yes, I I think I think where we as modern people get stuck is in this um, geometrical trap. We fall we fall into a geometrical trap. And we think parallel. They're separate. They're moving at the same time. They do not intersect, right? Because that's that's the whole that's the definition of parallel lines. They do not intersect. Well, in some cases they do, but in this case, it's like we're thinking of it like they're two separate things. That it's a it's a separate place that only through special circumstances they interact. And it's and it's like only when the ducks are just lined up enough they interact. And there's another trap that we fall into where there's these planes of existence. There's higher and lower planes, and and they're all separate. But somehow, you know, we can get there if we do the right techniques and the right rituals, and we follow the right people. And and I think, I think these are all all sort of intellectual traps we can fall into because it separates us from everything else, right? You know, and and the way that it was viewed, and you can you can see it if you if you kind of like. If you if you look at it in a certain way, there's no separation in the layers of reality, right? All this stuff that's happening, it's happening at the same time, and they don't differentiate it either. It's not like you see one thing that's like, well, you know, uh, <laughs> let's go with like Herod, right? Herod taxed a bunch of people, and you know, he did X, Y, and Z. Meanwhile, this spiritual thing was happening over here, and that had nothing to do with it. It's like that's not really how it worked. It was all it was all connected. And there's this tremendous disconnect we have today as modern people where it's like, well, you know, it's a parallel world interacting with us. Therefore, it's something separate. It is not special. It is not a part of this world. It is, you know, it's it's something separate outside. It's something multidimensional. And in a sense, it is. But the problem is we're thinking of it like, you know, circles that don't touch each other, whereas we need to think of it like sort of a, a like a, Hmm. I'm trying not to not to sound reductionist by calling it a sandwich, but that's the best thing I can kind of think of it as. Um, where it's it's one entity, right? You know, it's one thing that's happening, but there's many different portions of it that are all creating the sandwich, the reality in which we exist. And there's all these separate things that are going on. Doesn't mean it's not multiversal. If anything it makes it more integrated into the subjective experience of reality, right? Because all these people, you know, whether you look at the Bible, the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata Gita, or like any of these ancient documents, right, they all write in a similar style. And they don't differentiate between the events. It's not like you're looking at a history book. And I, I heard this argument forever ago by dumb people that was like, well, you know, it's it's just a story. It's not history. And it's like, well, just because they tell history differently, right, because it's a, it's a story. History is a story, no matter how, no matter which way you cut it, right? Every every story you read for history is a story, and it's told by a certain point of view using certain people's points of view to create a narrative. That's just what history is. And so, in this instance, you what? know, if we're yes, Father, we are. Um, okay. In, in this in this instance, just checking. Yes. So the so in this instance. Um, the the whole the whole point right I'm, I'm kind of getting off track here because I'm I'm going to relate it back to this is that 
if you if we if we look at it in such a way where well you know it's just a fun little story that tells moral lessons it's like yeah you can look at it that way if you if you wish um, you know if you want to look at it as oh it's aliens doing things yeah sure you can look at at it that way if you wish I mean but you're missing a whole portion of the story you know that's kind of the the interesting thing about you know not just the Bible but other ancient documents if you if you really really look at it you can get a lot of different things out of it depending on what lens you look at it and that's the subject object problem and in this instance you know if we're trying to kind of look at it and think of it like well you know how how did the ancients who you know were working on this think about things and they thought about it in a very different way and they experienced reality in a very different way you know mythology was very real to them and in a sense it still is real to us today otherwise we wouldn't be doing this show you know and, and how we view it and how we understand it is very different now and Arguably, I'd say we don't understand it because we're trying very hard to like take these these other this like you know this other portion of reality and kind of reduce it to scientific terms, which just gets rid of the the majesty of the cosmos, in my opinion. But you know, if you're if you want to look at it like, well, you know, are there multiverse things in the Bible? Then yes, yes, there are, but there's much more to it. There's many layers to it, and none of them are separate. They're all interacting together to create this narrative, this story that ultimately is, is we were able to relate to in some way, shape, or form even you know thousands of years later. And that's the point, is that it's meant to mimic the human experience in many ways. You know, it's like I, I heard a really interesting thing that the, that, uh, the Psalms are like essentially, it's, it's the most human portion of the Bible because it goes through this roller coaster of emotions and experiences, and it's meant to kind of mimic the human experience through poetry, essentially. And so in this instance, it's like, yeah, you can look at it that way too, but there's other portions of it where it points to these other realities and these other portions of reality that are not separate. <laughs> they are a portion of, of how we exist in the world. You know, I think that's very well said. You know, this question came up and a show a few weeks ago where someone was asking, how is it that uh, in in the post-resurrection period in the, in the New Testament, Jesus appeared physically, uh, particularly because of Thomas, the apostle, doubting Thomas, as he's called, uh, said, I won't believe it till I see him in the flesh. And there was Jesus, and he put, put your hand in the wound, in my hands and on my side and uh, the person, the listener was asking how could that happen and we explained it in a sort of a multiversal point of view yeah, they, these worlds are not separate they, they look separate behind me but they blend all the time and where we live is up to the unity we have in our own hearts based on love and respect, I think that's really true. So, um, we're ready to move on. We have Christopher. This came in through YouTube, so we don't necessarily know where these folks live. Uh, <laughs> let me see if I can locate it, because I clicked the link and it took me to nowhere. <laughs> oh, it's right after Doug there. Well, I, I can read it. If you have uh, why do, this is Christopher, as I say. Why do people who believe in reincarnation generally believe it is benign? What's to say it's not the result of malevolence? Someone or something sending us back over here and over to suffer in this world. No sane person should want to come back here. Uh, the first thing I noticed, uh, kind of a negative approach to uh, our uh, current uh, facet, as we would call it, in our super life, our current life uh, here, I <clears throat> I don't know. I know a lot of people who like to come back uh, and maybe do things better than they did them before. Uh, I might be one of those, you know, avoid certain mistakes um, and 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 make the same good decisions, such as marrying your mother, Ben, and uh, having my two wonderful sons. But in any case, uh, I think reincarnation doesn't work that way. Uh, <clears throat> if uh, the multiverse is as we think it is, all possibilities exist, 
Uh, we're out there in many different facets, many different worlds, living parallel lives, and it's all pretty much uh, us to do with as we uh, can uh, best deal with it. Uh, so <clears throat> as far as uh, reincarnation is concerned, it's assumed in the classical approach that these are successive lives. Uh, you know, you die and you come back as somebody else or whatever. Uh, in the multiverse, it wouldn't work that way. Even without the multiverse, uh, physicists such as Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, and others have uh, pretty much determined through the special theory of relativity and other time uh, exercises that time does not exist that way. There really is no past, present, or future. It's pretty much of an eternal now. We're only aware of it through our consciousness because we haven't gotten to the point where we can deal with an eternal now. We experience past or future. So I think in that sense, the question may be uh, misdirected in a time sense. But nevertheless, um, I, I get the, the question. If you don't want to uh, repeat your mistakes, uh, then I would say keep everything as positive as you can. Keep uh, love at the center of your life. Um, love God, wherever, whatever you consider God to be, with your whole heart, your whole mind, and your whole soul. And be grateful. Uh, as I've said a number of other times, uh, particularly in the pastoral training in the seminary, I've stood at the deathbed of several atheists. All of them were terrified, and all of them, one of one was a doctor, asked me about God. And I said, just say thank you. That's all you have to do. And uh, I've talked about that elsewhere. But uh, I don't know, Ben. You have any comments on this? Um, I mean, I guess it's. I I always. I don't know. I I I never. The idea of reincarnation never really appealed to me either. Not for the exact same, you know, incredibly negative reasons. It's just I don't know. I I it never it never just seemed interesting <clears throat> to me. I thought it was rather boring, um, considering the the depth of of experience, <laughs> out outside of it. Um, I always found that the the sort of more moderny definition of it is just very um uh what's the word uh, su- su- just very surface level yeah superficial right. yeah superficial very surface level it's it's very i don't know i just it just never really appealed to me i i get the idea um just by yeah you know, just like the the old idea of hinduism you know the, the, how they how they viewed it was you know or how they do view it i should say as as kind of just being like something that needs to be escaped, so you you keep going through this cycle until eventually you you get out of it, and it's you know, and, and I think that's really kind of a more interesting take on it. But I guess it's it's just kind of, I, I think one of the things that's that that you brought up that I I think really should be addressed is kind of how time functions, because that's that's really really important because it's base level, right? It's it's like you know it's one of those things that's assumed. Because there's a lot of you know boxes that need to be ticked in order for certain things to work, and in this case, reincarnation, at least in a modern sense, would need to be in order for it to function in the way that that sort of is popularized. It would need time to kind of flow backwards and forwards, and I, I think it's really interesting that you know both Saint Augustine and Heidegger kind of say the same thing, because Heidegger basically just copied and pasted and just put some more sciency terms in there. Um, hmm. That really, it's just you know, I, I kind of liked how, how it was put, where it was like, you know, the past already happened, therefore it is no more. The future hasn't happened yet, therefore it doesn't exist. And when I think about, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, I'm probably going to butcher it, um, where uh, in book, I want to say it was seven of the Confessions, where St. Augustine brings it up, where he, he, he says, um, you know, if you ask, you know, if, if you ask me to d- define time and I start thinking about it, like, you know, I know what time is, but when you ask me to define it, I can't define it. And it's and it's the same sort of thing, right? You know, it's one of the great 
sort of mysteries is that you know what is time how does how does it function why does it function so differently for different people and you know it it's i i think that's that's the big that's one of the big sort of uh, you know thorns in the side of of that idea is that we just don't we don't have a lot of definitions for these things and really it just kind of comes down to the sub, a subjective experience of of this objective reality whatever the objective reality is you know it's like we can yes. know, we can know how um how certain things act in the world but we can't know its essence and it's it's the same with this right you know i know that there you know death happens people die you know they translate whatever you want to call it but you know how it's experienced right i know how it is in the world i see it i go to wakes you know funerals etc uh, but like you know, all I don't know its essence. I don't know what happens after that. I have an idea, I have vague ideas. You know what people tell me. You know what we've heard on the show. You know what we've sort of experienced in a way. But at the end of the day, it's like you know, all I have is just some stories from people, and and you know that's that's really all I kind of have to work with. Not a lot of data points to tell me if reincarnation is a thing or not. And you know who knows? Maybe it's a simulation. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. You know, and at the end of the day, it's just kind of we try to work with these things and and make sense of it as best we can, um, and try to live the best lives we can. Yeah, I agree with that certainly. But the, there's no denying that uh, there are lots of uh, <clears throat> anecdotal stories. Excuse me. Oh no, I'm not denying that. It's not at all. Um, the only, the only, I'm not, gonna, I'm not denying people's experiences because they experience the things I didn't. It's, and then the other side of the coin is I didn't experience those things. So that's that's kind of the the thing there. I I, I don't disagree with any of it. It's just I I often wonder if it's like a cultural thing. I, I remember this is this, this is a little little off topic, but kind of similar. Um, one of my really good friends is uh, from Southeast India. And I remember we we were talking about something, and I think we were talking about Bigfoot. And he was saying that when he moved to this country, he was like, "Oh yeah, Haruman." And I was, and he was saying that like you know he somehow something came up when he was a kid. And he was like, "Oh yeah, Haruman," which is like you know a, a demon that kind of functions like Bigfoot in, in in Indian mythology, or well Hindu mythology, I should be specific. Um, he's like, yeah, that's totally a thing. And, you know, and he was like, I was surprised when I came to America. And, uh, you know, nobody knew what that was. Everyone was like, yeah, Bigfoot's not real. And he was like, oh, okay, well, it's, it's a thing. It's accepted. It is what it is. And I thought that was super interesting because I, we discussed that, like, years later. And I, ne- I never knew that because this was only maybe, like, a year or two ago where we, we talked about this. And I thought it was really fascinating um, that he he was like yeah it was just accepted he's like I thought it was weird that nobody here like accepted that and I was I was like well mm. well, well welcome to the West <laughs> and, and it's it, it is really interesting because it makes you wonder if the cultural um, backgrounds of people kind of inform well obviously their cultural backgrounds inform their experience of the world because how else are you going to interpret things right if of course if that's if that's like you know how are you experiencing reality, you know? And fortunately, growing up with you and having plenty of books and all sorts of fun little resources, none of this stuff that we talk about today is, like, whoa, crazy to me. It's just, it, it just, it is what it is. And it's a part of reality, and that's just what it is. But for a lot of people, I think really over time, things have kind of gotten more and more accepted. But, you know, years ago, it's like, you know, you sound like a crazy person if you started bringing up Bigfoot and Mothman and canine cryptids and ufos and stuff and now now look at us right you know the <laughs> all all of this stuff is kind of becoming a part of the american mythology and that's just what it is and so perhaps it is even that this sort of more goofy little modern idea of reincarnation will become a part of american mythology because it's <clears> kind <throat> of a hodgepodge of different things and if there's one thing that you know one, one of my old professors uh i i took a class with uh, forever ago. It was one of my last classes I took in college, and it was a lecture on globalism globalism and uh, uh, religion. And it was it was super interesting because she said, you can always tell a culture by its food. And American food is just like a mishmash of like different things, and it's not quite authentic, and it takes the 
the like you know the tastiest parts, the saltiest, the sweetest, and it just kind of makes its own thing out of it. But it's not really real, you know. It's like authentic, you know, Chinese food is very different than you know going down the street to your local Chinese place. It's 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 kind of like a like a mishmash of different things that we know as Chinese food. And so it's kind of I often wonder if it's the same thing with spirituality, you know. And that's yeah, that's a yeah. long way to answer this question, but I I do think that that's an important part of this. And speaking of important parts, we are coming up to our break. Uh, you are listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno coming to you from New England's rainy but beautiful Black Sun River Valley here on WON AM and FM. We'll be right back. The St. Anne Auction Cultural Center is celebrating Christmas in July at Cellos in Woonsocket on July 16th. This family-friendly event will feature tropical holiday music, summer Christmas decor, and of course Santa and Mrs. Claus will be on hand for pictures. Participate and be entered to win special prizes. To participate, pick up a sponsor card at these supporting businesses. The Honey Shop, Timeless Antiques, Champ's Diner, Missy's Family Restaurant, Bilo's Flowers, Vos True Value Hardware, Little General, or print the card online from the St. Anton Cultural Center website. Local and live at 99.5 FM. Hello, and welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I am Ben, and that is my dad, Paul, coming to us via Skype today. And we are taking listener questions on all sorts of interesting subjects, and I unintentionally created a great segue into our next question, which I believe is from Illyrian, um, who... Yes who writes to us. Um, I wouldn't want official disclosure. Uh, if you look at human history, you will see that every time a more advanced, quote-unquote, civilization comes into contact with a lesser, quote-unquote, advanced civilization, the lesser is destroyed. Uh, either the, cultural, the culture essentially disappears or through colonization or violence. Yeah, I kind of tend to agree with that. I think a lot of caution is advisable. If you look at the even more recent history, uh, I think you see examples of well-intentioned, quote-unquote, advanced civilization, uh, sort of inadvertently destroying uh, indigenous cultures, you know. And I think that's something we have to be aware of. Now, there are other layers to the entire uh, alien question, where are they from? Are they really from other planets? Are they from other times? Uh, parallel worlds, as we've been talking about, we, we really are all, all three, or none of the above, and there are other possibilities too. So I think we have to uh, be aware that wherever or whenever these people come from, uh, there may be many different kinds, some of whom are hostile, as in the parasites we talk about, uh, some of whom are benign and some of whom are neutral. There is some evidence that there have been wars among them that had nothing to do with us except that we were caught in the middle. So um, I, I tend to agree with Illyrian that a great deal of caution is required here when it comes to uh, uh, disclosure. Uh, and then I'll say what I always say, and that's uh, uh, if information comes from the government, I don't particularly trust it as being accurate, complete, or without an agenda. And Ben, a few shows ago, asked a brilliant question that I've asked in the context of uh, my uh, working with MUFON, and I've asked eminent experts this, and uh, they have trouble answering. What's in it for the government in making any kind of disclosure to us? And uh, then that was the uh, $64,000 question. Well, Steve Alton was probably the only person who gave any sort of answer to that. Yeah. And, um, and he's not a UFO expert. No, 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 no. But he is a disclosure expert. So I got well, sure ex- he is. expert. Um, you know, he he does he he did give an interesting answer to that. I don't know how much I agree, but his his answer essentially was that it would be a unifying force um, in a country that's incredibly divided currently. Um, yeah. I <clears throat> don't know how much I agree with that personally. Um, 
only because it's it's already kind of a divisive thing in and of itself. I I I would be curious to see what would happen if that if if disclosure ever happened. But I, I think I think in in honor of of being devil's advocate here, I I would say that um you know just to kind of flip the script ever so slightly, uh, Illyrian that we we have the misfortune of being humans and we do not know or understand anything that is completely alien from us. Um, you could make arguments, uh, that, you know, aliens have been interacting with us forever. Um, that they were the gods of the ancient world. They built the pyramids, blah, 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 that they did all that. But at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, you know, just like, I don't, I don't know. Well, I'm going to make a reference to a very, to, to this thing I always make a reference to, which is Thomas Nagel's essay or book, which is, you know, what is it like to be a bat? Um, which we, the ultimate answer to that question is we do not know what it is like to be a bat, and we will never know what it is like to be a bat because all we would know is being a human consciousness in a bat body. We would never know what it is like to think like a bat, to be a bat. We would only know how to, you know, do things that we think are bat-like or bat batty, if you will. Um... And in this instance, you know, I don't think we will ever know completely um, what it is to to be uh, an extraterrestrial, if that is what they are. We we would never know, you know, who's to say they have the same moral structure we do? Who's to say that they even have a similar language? You know, it's like at least like most human languages. You know, they, they're not exactly one to one, but like you know, you can translate things. You know, how, how would we even be able to do that? You know, how would it resemble any of our languages? You know, e- even something as basic as communication, it's it's like, you know, we, we wouldn't really be able to do it. It's like, you know, the, the further you go, the, the more, there, there's little to no similarities unless you, unless you want to, you know, say, well, you know, the encounters that have happened, they do have like, you know, similar physiologies to us. And it's like, well, do they? You know, it's like they, they happen to be bipedal in some instances, you know, depending on who you talk to. You know, some of them, they communicate via, you know, telepathy. Some of them don't. It's 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 hard to tell because, again, it comes down to the essence and energies argument, right? We can know a thing by how it acts in the world, its energies, but we do not know its essence, what it is, you know? And you can even say that for regular people, you know? Just because, you know, my I, my dad is my dad doesn't mean I actually, I, I know him, know his essence. I know my dad for a lot of things, you know? I know that he's a really great guy, you know, he's very caring, he, he's very passionate, he's very intelligent, great speaker, you know, he, he does all these things. But I, I, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I just know him as my dad. I do not know Paul Eno as intimately as he knows himself, right? Or even, if you want to say, go a step farther, as much as the divine does. And I could say the same for me, right? You know, everybody knows me as, through how I act on the air, you know, but nobody knows me, the, you know, the, the real essence of it. And it's the same with extraterrestrials. You know, all we have is how they've acted in the world so far, which in some senses is conjecture, um, and others it's like, you know, it sounds both either, you know, incredibly, um, you know, so, something akin to, like, utopian, or, you know, something incredibly, you know, terrifying. There's, and there seems to be no in-between. They're either here to help us and save us and, you know, shift the paradigm into a new into a new world, or they're here to, you know, enslave us, <clears throat> capture us, you know, test on us, and etc., and we don't really know, you know. All we know is we have these ideas. So it's 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 very it's very hard to say what they would do because you know we're basing our our ideas off of what human civilizations have done to each other. You know, I I don't know how much we would know about you know alien civilizations <clears throat> doing things to us. And I guess really it's it's kind of like sociology, right? I I remember um, I took a really interesting class in college on sociology, and I remember. My uh, my professor at the time was like, yeah, you know, we base all of our statistics on things that have already happened. And I was like, well, what about things that haven't happened yet? And he was like, well, then we just have to wait and see what happens. <laughs> and and it was it was a cheeky answer, but he's not wrong. You know, it's 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 the same with a lot of with a lot of these things. It's like, you know, we don't we kind of base our 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 guesstimates on what will happen based on things that have happened before. So it's a safe it's a it's an educated guess to say that. You know, perhaps imperialization would happen, 
But you know, the, the the side of the coin is, you know, we know next to nothing about extraterrestrials, and I don't think we really can because they're nothing like us, alien in every sense of the word. You know what I mean? Well, this as a devil's advocate, there is a uh, a growing popularity to a theory that uh, they may be quite like us. And I tend to agree with you, Ben, but uh, <clears throat> particularly if the panspermia theory is true, uh, there may be humanoids uh, throughout the galaxy that have been seeded uh, by the panspermia thing, which is essentially the theory that... Uh, uh, life is the uh, rule in the universe rather than the exception, and the comets and other uh, so-called gas clouds uh, seed planets with DNA or the other elements of life that grow into uh, living populations. <clears throat> the um, so I mean there's there's that point of view as well. Uh, so. As you say, though, ultimately we just don't know yet if we ever will. Right. That's that's <clears> kind <throat> of the thing. Is I think what's really important is discernment. How we how we yes. understand the questions. You know, I think it's it's really easy to fall into a trap of, well, they they're here to help us. They're here to hurt us, and then that's it. You know, there's nothing else. There's no considering the idea anymore. It's just you're in one or the other, and there's no in between. Because I'm not saying one way or the other. I think what's really what we, I think really the crux of it is how we understand our relationship, not just to ourselves, but to the world around us, and understanding how little we know. You know, not just about the what's outside of us, right? Not just what's outside, you know, our our bubbles, but how little we know about ourselves and how we interact with the world around us. That's that's step 1 before we even get to <laughs> you know, trying to understand extraterrestrials if that is indeed what they are, you know? Cuz yeah. I I think I think that's cuz that's that's a that's a big problem. If we can't understand ourselves and our motivations how can we understand something that's completely alien from us you know because if, if empathizing is a, is a thing in this instance right how can we empathize with something that we've that feels something completely different than we do you know right what if they have yeah. different emotions moral structures that's that's a whole other thing and I've, I've brought this up before you know and and nobody's ever really been able to answer it they just kind of say well you know they're here to help and it's like okay well you know how do we <laughs> You know, we we developed our morals in a very specific way, and and how they develop now is is, is you know who's to say that they had a, a you know morals today were not the morals of of millennia ago, you know yeah, who's to say it's going to be the same you know it's it's I don't think it's fair to ascribe you know twenty twenty three you know morals values and ethics to completely alien entities you know what I mean yeah well we have two questions from. Uh... Lowenthal88 from YouTube, but they are so insightful that I think we don't have time really to deal with them. And we'll hold them for the next open line show. Uh, is that okay with you, Ben? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, why don't we take Phil Phil's question? Phil from Savannah, Georgia. Sure thing. So Phil writes to us, uh, there's a buzz around Savannah this summer that black-eyed children, quote-unquote, have been uh, knocking on a few doors lately. There are various interpretations of what they are, but they seem to be energy parasites. Is there no end to the shape-shifting capabilities of energy parasites? Uh, what is your take on these black-eyed children? You want to jump on that? Uh, yeah, sure. I I, th- I think it's 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 fun um, in, in the sense that it's a, it's a really... It's a really kind of spooky story, and I'm. I I think I've read a, I've read a lot of interesting accounts about it, because um, for some reason it just the idea of it is just fascinating to me, and I I wonder um, I'd really be interested to see some of these reports because it always seems like it's either one or like a handful of them will show up like three, like and it's 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 
interesting. They never like a huge group, and they always ask to use somebody's phone, and it and that was the thing that I always thought was interesting. It's like, oh, can I use your phone? Like I'm, I'm looking for you know I'm I'm, I'm you know whatever, and it's like, you know, this is 2023. Who who. <laughs> Who comes over to ask to use your phone anymore? I don't know anybody that has a house phone. Well, uh, I'm sorry, present company excluded. Um, it, it's it's uh, even then it's it's uh, I think mom only uses it for like certain things, and the rest of the time it's just like you know uh, telemarketers. But anyway, so the so the the idea of it is just. It, it makes me think of like Dracula a little bit. You know, enter of your own free will type right. type idea. Um, and and I often wonder because I, I I'm trying to remember some of the parallels in experiences. I don't know if it was in certain parts of the country that it happened, but it, it does seem odd that they're popping up more and more now. I I'd, I'd really want to know more. So Phil, if you have any in, information, yeah. articles, accounts, anything, I I'd be really interested to hear because that I mean really it's 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 definitely reminiscent of like you know the ideas of you know you have to invite them in. For stuff to happen, although I've never read any reports about anybody letting them in. Usually, they get freaked out and you know close the door. Well, I have. Uh, have you actually? Yes. Uh, the background of this is that the, the uh, black-eyed children are uh, that there are these children who appear to be normal, except that their eyes are entirely black. You know, which of course is reminiscent of the alien grays and that kind of thing. They uh, <clears throat> uh, reports have them appearing at people's doors uh, very often uh, at night and asking to use the phone or for some other reason to come in. They might say they're lost, or looking for their parents, uh, need food, something like that, need some kind of help. And I've read one instance where these children were led into a home and uh, the uh, they eventually disappeared right in front of the homeowner's eyes. But all sorts of uh, misfortunes and things, uh, poltergeist activity began to take place in this house. Now, there's no way to know whether these stories are true or accurate. So <clears throat> as a result, we take them sometimes with a pillar of salt. Uh there, on the usual occasions, people are so creeped out they don't let them in. There are other occasions where people have been in their cars, and <clears throat> excuse me, supposedly these black-eyed children will come to the car windows and request some kind of help. Uh, usually, this is in the middle of nowhere, where they children wouldn't be at night. You know, so uh, these are, these are the stories. But uh, I uh, echo Ben there that, uh, Phil, if you could send us more uh, details. And uh, to answer the question about the shape-shifting capabilities of energy parasites, which are <clears throat> commonly known as demons, um, that's kind of my take on black-eyed children. They usually turn out, in the stories I've heard, to be parasites. We've never had a case... And I've never had a case in 53 years of having to deal with black-eyed children. I, I've never seen one. <clears throat> so presumably it's not that common. But I think uh, these things very often do. Anything negative very often turns out to be parasitical. And uh, these, these phenomena will morph into poltergeist cases or something negative of that kind. So my only advice would be, if you run into this, don't let them in and just shut the door and start praying. That's what I would say. Mm, yeah, makes sense to me. Because boy, oh boy, we don't need spooky children coming up to the door. Yeah. Life's already confusing enough. <laughs> we don't need that. <clears throat> Why don't we, uh, you know, I hate, I, hate, I hate not to deal with Lowenthal's questions, but uh, if we want to uh, skip to Atacama Humanoid, that's the, uh, see at the bottom of the page there, man. Bottom of the page. <clears throat> uh, I'm 
also came in through uh, YouTube, you which we are trying to mend our ways and check the comments on the YouTube uh, recordings of the show that are posted usually in the next day after the live broadcast. Well, I, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm still I'm still looking for it because I'm, I'm just looking. Oh, at I, I'll read. It. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, as someone mentioned on a forum several years ago, and I never forgot, Christian exorcisms are a big ordeal that takes several days, if they work at all, during which time the priest or someone else usually ends up getting attacked by the demon, and the demon may move hosts. At the end, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Uh, possess somebody else in the house. In contrast, Buddhist exorcism consists of monks showing up and chanting for an afternoon, then having some tea and leaving peacefully. The latter obviously works much better, and Buddhists are atheists in the sense of an ultimate creator deity. Okay, well, there are a number of interesting points here. Uh, <clears throat> Christian exorcisms are a big ordeal. I participated in a bunch of them many years ago. Uh, my, opi- uh, my opinion was that they were not what they appeared to be, <clears throat> that the uh, demon, or as we would call the energy parasite, was feeding off what we were doing, and very often we were making it worse. Uh, not always. Sometimes they seemed to work. Uh, and they could take a lot more than several days. They could take weeks, or in some cases even months. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, priest, it's very institutionalized. The priest has to get the permission of the bishop, and not every priest is allowed to uh, proceed with it. Uh, <clears throat> I never knew the priest I worked with to be attacked by the parasite as such. I was attacked verbally by the thing, as I've mentioned on a number of shows before. Uh, <clears throat> Buddhists, on the other hand, and uh, Jewish rabbis, whom I love to work with because they're so refreshing in their positive attitudes, uh, are <clears throat> also very good Buddhists. And uh, the writer is correct. Uh, Buddhists do not officially recognize a creator god you know as such the uh, Buddhism, Buddhism is a, really more of a philosophy than a religion and it's the philosophy of overcoming uh, the passions that create pain and overcoming those and attaining a state of enlightenment which is uh, not so different from many religions uh, <clears throat> So uh, I um, have only seen one Buddhist exorcism, and it was uh, pretty much the same as is described here. Uh, with the Orthodox Christian background, the Orthodox believe that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and there are little exorcism prayers pretty much in everything uh, to avoid the problem before it happens. So orthodox exorcisms are not all that complicated either. So Ben, what do you say about this? Um, I think it's important to recognize uh, an important question that often goes uh, along with it that never gets asked, which is what exactly is possession? Um, yeah. You know, it's it's just kind of assumed. Well, you know, <laughs> a demon takes over you and uh, done. That's it. And in in some cases. Um, you know, I don't know if that's entirely true. I th- I think that there's it's not there's there's a it's it's a it's an explanation to something that's I think very simplified, and it's it doesn't do the phenomena justice because there's there's a a point of it where there's a tacit agreement between two things, or between two entities in this case, right? So there's there's um. You know the the possess e and the possessor, whatever that is, right? You know, there's there's a really interesting um, parallel I've heard between um, addiction being being a a possessor of a sense, because there was an idea that was posited, you know, in in the Eastern Church forever ago that you know if you 
you can be possessed by the passions in a sense, right? So these would be, I guess, the, the closest to thing to describe it to like you know, Western people is like the seven deadly sins, right? Although they don't number them, it's it's something like that, where you know there there's this idea that these things can kind of take over your life if you allow them to, because there's an agreement there, right? And you would often notice you know a physical change with that person, right? There's there's a really Sometimes, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, pictures of people, you know, it's like, oh, you know, look at this person who was, you know, they were on drugs and now they're not anymore. And you see, like, physical differences between them. You know, and the idea is that they were possessed by the, the substances, you know, whatever it may be. And there's an agreement there. You know, and, you know, it's like, well, you know, that's not really fair. There's no spiritual dimension to it. And it's like, well, there is, you know, there's a dimension to that in everything, right? You know, when we give power to certain things... You know, whether it's parasites who are essentially powerless unless we give them power to act, you know, and it's the same with the with with everything really, you know, and it can it can it can take over and it can, you know, be the main focus of your life and become an obsession, and that's just, you know, how things go. And it's it sounds like a, a less sort of romanticized version of it. Well, you know, a demon came in in the night and took over my my brain my heart my body etc and it's like well no there's a, there's a portion of it where it, there's an agreement on both parties i don't think it's not a thing because i've seen some weird stuff uh, but it, it's i think that there's there's a depth to it that we kind of miss and especially since it's it's like you know we we allow certain things to take over our life and allow things to take control because we say well you know sure i'll allow it and that's that's the important part is that there's an allowance from the from a party to allow it to happen whether it's you know a substance you know a parasite or something like that you know there's a connection that's made that that creates this need and that's kind of the thing that i think is in a sense sort of universal throughout all these experiences yeah i tend to agree with that also when i've seen the nitty-gritty possession cases it seems that uh, the uh, parasite discovers the identity point, which is a term we had to admit uh, to talk about this, uh, with the person where they, it's a place and time in the multiverse where they are one, where the parasite is one of the facets of the person being possessed. And uh, that's a pretty deep and weird concept. But I've never seen total takeover of a parasite of a of a person by a parasite uh, without some and that there is some sort of as Ben said tacit agreement between the possessed person and the parasite uh, but that's about all we have time for right now and uh, we better get into our announcements indeed we should and, uh, yeah. So I will start off here. So if you are in the area, or if you are in the area, or anywhere near uh, New England, you can take a gander at the Exeter UFO Festival. That's on Labor Day weekend, September second and third. Uh, the event uh, benefits local children's charities. Uh, sadly, we have had to bow out this year um, because of my dad's health. Uh, but please go and support it. Uh, it is a wonderful event, and it's and it's great. It benefits. You know, it's put on by the local Kiwanis Club. A lot of lot of big names that go, and it's it's a real fun time. Um, you can get more info at the ExeterUFOFestival dot org. Uh, and the Greater New England UFO Conference is back. Uh, this one will be a one day event in uh, November. That's on November fourth in Lemonster, Massachusetts. You can watch for more information on that, and you can visit our show website behindtheparanormal.com where you can find nearly uh, 1,200 hours of our regular shows and special broadcasts since 2008 from CBS Radio, Achieve Radio and here on WOON AM and FM. Uh, also, you can hear many of these broadcasts on the pod- on major podcast platforms including uh, iTunes, Spotify and YouTube. And as we mentioned, the Lowenthal's questions, which are very insightful, we will uh, put off till August 13th our next open line show. Uh, They may take the whole show, but they're very good questions. Low and tall. Whoever you may be or wherever, thank you for sending those in. Uh, Meantime, download our show app. It's free at BehindTheParanormal.com and browse our books along with those of our guest co-hosts. 
And on our website, you can find our charity page that has links to several good causes we've adopted over the years, including Hope for Hilldale <coughs> Cemetery uh, in Haverhill, Massachusetts, USA Cares, Canadian Veterans Advocacy, Helping Haiti's Orphans, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, the Sisterhood of Ground Zero, and most recently, a, ground, uh, a GoFundMe uh, page for the folks in East Palestine and Ohio, uh, site of the recent train wreck and chemical fire. So what's cooking for next week, Ben? Well, on uh, July 23rd, British researcher and retired detective Gary Hesseltine returns to continue our discussion on his new findings about the Rendlesham Forest UFO incidents. We leave you today with a thought from that old sweetheart, Albert Einstein. The true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno. And thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey. And we shall see you Return next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now.